Good evening. My name is Ron Weich, and I'm the Dean at the University of Baltimore School of Law. I'd like to welcome you all. Some of you spend your days here, but not all of you, so I'd like to welcome everybody to the new John and Francis Angelos Law Center, our very exciting new home. Um, I, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to the Center on Applied Feminism's conference on Applied Feminism and Health. Those of you who will be here tomorrow morning will hear a fuller uh, welcome from me, and we'll talk about the conference. But my role here tonight is uh, very important but limited, and my role is simply to introduce Professor Michelle Gilman, who will introduce our keynote speaker, Terry O'Neill. Uh, Michelle Gilman is one of our hosts tonight as uh, a co-director of the Center on Applied Feminism, along with uh, Professor Margaret Johnson and Professor Lee Goodmark. Michelle has been a member of the University of Baltimore faculty for about 16 years, um, and she plays a very important role in our school. Uh, she directs the Civil Advocacy Clinic, one of the most important aspects of our school, one of the ways in which we provide students with real-life uh, legal experience uh, during the course of their legal education. Um, and uh, as I said, she's co-director of the Center on Applied Feminism, uh, one of our uh, most important centers here at the school. Um, she has many important activities, many important duties. Uh, she's a renowned teacher and, in fact, has received uh, the Outstanding Teacher of the Year Award from, uh, from the students at the University of Baltimore um, and is uh, a renowned scholar on uh, welfare and, uh, and other issues. Uh, she's active in the community, is president of the uh, Public Justice Center, um, and uh, perhaps uh, one of the most important things she's done in recent years is she chaired the search committee uh, that resulted in me becoming dean of the school. <laughs> so, so I'm personally high on Michelle Gilman. And uh, please join me in welcoming her to the podium as she introduces our keynote speaker, Terry O'Neill. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I am delighted to have the honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Terry O'Neill. Ms. O'Neill is the president of the National Organization for Women, which is the largest organization of feminist activists in the entire United States. It was founded in 1966 by Betty Friedan and other renowned feminist activists, and since then, now has been dedicated to making legal, political, social, and economic change in our society in order to achieve the goals of eliminating sexism and ending oppression. We're not there yet, but <laughs> hopefully someday. Um, I think it's important for a law, an audience made up of many law students to know that there are a lot of ways to effectuate positive social change. And this is something we strive for here in our own Center on Applied Feminism. And now is a role model for that sort of holistic and systemic advocacy. Now, achieves its goals through a variety of tools. It holds marches, rallies, pickets, counter demonstrations, nonviolent civil disobedience. It uses intensive lobbying, grassroots political organizing, and litigation, including class action lawsuits. And leading the charge is Terry O'Neill, who has served as NOW's president for the last five years. Ms. O'Neill graduated from Northwestern University and earned her law degree at Tulane. Her start in feminist activism began in the 1990s, fighting against the campaign of right-wing extremist David Duke in Louisiana, and that political organizing, from what I understand, is what brought her into NOW's fold. Along her way to becoming the national president of NOW, Ms. O'Neill served as a past president of Maryland NOW, and we're delighted about her connections to our state. Ms. O'Neill is also a former law professor, but I don't think she's gonna go Socratic on anyone tonight, so everyone can relax. And she's also worked as a political strategist on both the national and state levels. Talk about doing a lot with a law degree. Keep that in mind, students. So tonight, Ms. O'Neill will be speaking to us about why voter mobilization may end up being the most important aspect of legal developments in the next few years. There's a role for each and every one of us to play in maintaining a vibrant democracy that supports equality and opportunity, and we look, for, we look forward to learning more from Ms. O'Neill about the challenge that lies ahead of us. So welcome, and we look forward to hearing from you.
There we go. Everybody hear me? So thank you so much, Professor Gilman. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really, really, it's, it's always wonderful for me when I can come to a law school, sort of feel like I'm, I'm back uh, uh, where I uh, spent about 12 years on the Tulane Law Faculty. Um, and, and, some, and I miss it, you know, every now and then. I am, I am <laughs> every now and then. Um, I, I really am especially pleased to see a whole conference dedicated to feminist legal theory. Um, I actually taught feminist legal theory when I was at Tulane, <coughs> post-tenure. I applied to teach that. Um, and, and I think uh, it, it, it is really a good time for those in the legal community to sort of step back and take stock about where women are, uh, where women's legal rights are, where we're headed and, and where we need to go and how, how are we going to begin moving in the direction we need to move in. The reality is uh, that women's rights have stalled out in, in many ways. Uh, and, and I think that the legal community has a huge role to play in getting the women's rights movement back on track and back moving again. I want to talk about that for a little bit. But I, I want to assure you that I don't intend to spend the entire time talking to you. I want to hear from you and hear your questions. So what, really what I would like to do is sort of throw out some concepts or some, some challenges that the women's movement is facing right now. Um, and, uh, and talk a little bit about how we can meet those challenges. Uh, before I dive in, I do want to say thank you so much to the president of uh, Maryland Now, who is here, uh, Sarah Wilkinson. She's, uh, she's wonderful. I really appreciate your being here. So yes, I think that this year voting is probably one of the most important things that can happen in order to get the women's movement back on track. Uh, what do I mean by that? How many of you have heard of the rising American electorate? Raise your hand. Aha. Uh, oh, wait. Anybody? Some? Couple? A few? So the rising American electorate is kind of inside the beltway jargon for um, another, another way it's been described in the um, press is the Obama coalition. It's basically communities of color, immigrant communities, uh, younger voters and unmarried women. Now, unmarried women is is something that I've been paying a lot of attention to, uh, partly because there's a wonderful woman named Paige Gardner who's done a lot of study on it, and partly because that's that's sort of the National Organization for Women's um, niche. We we do uh, um, every time you poll unmarried women, they skew very strongly on all of our issues, right? Um, and, and, and Paige Gardner was one of the first researchers to identify the marriage voting gap in which unmarried women tend to vote much more on progressive, for progressive candidates for, and, and be supportive of progressive issues than married women. In 2010, on the heels of the United States Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United, which opened the floodgates for corporate funding of federal elections and state elections, on the heels of that disastrous decision, 2010 comes along, it's a midterm election, and what happens? Tea Party extremists flood into state legislatures and into the United States House of Representatives. The Tea Party has been calling the shots in the House of Representatives ever since. Since 2010, hundreds, hundreds of anti-choice measures have been passed into law in state after state after state. And these are states where previously we were able to bottle up those kinds of laws in committee, not after 2010. It was a disaster. And now you, so you take, take that fact and look at, at the voting patterns in 2010. Unmarried women's voter turnout rate in 2010, on average, was 38%. Overall turnout was low. It was about 46%. But the gap between the 38% for unmarried women and that 46% overall tells a huge story about how we ended up with so many right-wing uh, ideologues who are so right-wing that they are, they, at the state level, a lot of the laws that they've been passing uh, have been simply aimed at shutting down women's health clinics where abortions are performed. 
And make no mistake, at those health clinics, it's not just abortions that are performed, it's birth control is dispensed. And, and uh, cervical cancer screenings uh, are provided, and breast exams, and, uh, and, and other types of STD screenings and HIV screenings. So, so these are women's health clinics, and the goal of the politicians is simply to shut them down. Uh, and, and, and it's being, as I was driving up here from Washington, I'm listening to the radio and I hear a story about the, the, two, the two surviving uh, women's health clinics, there are abortion clinics uh, near El Paso, Texas, are closing their doors today. Thanks to the law that Wendy Davis filibustered successfully, but then got passed uh, uh, later on in a special session. So, um, so voting. Now, actually, my organization, both are, we, are, we are running a, uh, a foundation program in 2014 to uh, register and educate voters and uh, mobilize voters and make sure that unmarried women vote. We aim to get an overall turnout amongst unmarried women of 42% this year. You wouldn't think that would be a really big uh, stretch, <laughs> but it is. And I, and I say that because Maryland is a wonderful state. And, and I love living in Maryland. I live in, in Montgomery County, uh, right outside of Washington, D.C. But everybody in this room can help with turnout. You can go into Pennsylvania, where there's a really important governor's race. You can go into Northern Virginia, some of you, where there are really important uh, races going on. You can, you can get on the phone and simply make phone calls for Wendy Davis uh, to become governor of Texas. You can get on the phone and support a Senate candidates, especially um, in Kentucky with, uh, with um, oh, Grimes, I'm, I'm blanking. Anyway, with the Kentucky, there's a wonderful woman challenging uh, Mitch McConnell. You can, and you can do all of that on the phone. Uh, by the way, you'll be able to find out how to do that on NOW's website in, a, in about a couple of months. We're working on it. Um, so, so why is voting, I mean, what are the specific things we need to be looking for, what voters, why we want so many progressive uh, voters to go to the polls this year, here's why. Um, since 2010, and now I'm going to talk about the federal, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, the House of Representatives has voted uh, repeatedly since 2010 uh, in favor of a bill that we call the Let the Women Die Act, right? That is a law that is so extreme and would prohibit public hospitals, publicly supported hospitals, from uh, terminating a pregnancy even when the pregnant woman's life is at stake. Hence, we call it the Let the Women Die Act. Um, the House of Representatives recently passed uh, a, a bill that they call was it no taxpayer funding for abortion? What it actually does is cuts off all insurance coverage for abortion care, all, including uh, terminations of pregnancies caused by rape, including, um, I'm sorry, there was an exception. They, they decided to put in an exception for rape, but only if the IRS determined and approved that the woman's pregnancy was the result of rape. So this is a law that, if it were to pass, would require IRS rape audits in order to have your, your pregnancy termination uh, covered by your private insurance, right? It, it's it's absolutely uh, mind-boggling. Um, and, and I think many of you may not be familiar with the, um, with the statistics of how many women have abortions in the United States. One in three. One in three women will have an abortion by the age of 45. It is a necessary and common aspect of women's reproductive health care. Right. Um, only an ideologue who never had to wake up and worry about missing a period right, could be so extreme as to systematically block women from ordinary health care. Right. And by the way, you know, it's, anybody familiar with Hobby Lobby and the Hobby Lobby case, right? Um, so Hobby Lobby, for those of you who are not familiar, Hobby Lobby is a private for-profit company. Uh, they sell things, they're a little bit like Michael's, I guess, they, they sell stuff. Um, the individual who leads Hobby Lobby uh, 
is a man who does not believe that women should have access to birth control. Now, under the Affordable Care Act, the act lists a whole bunch of preventive health care services that insurance companies must cover without charging an extra copay, without charging a deductible. You have to have it. It's screenings for diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease. And, uh, and, and, it's, and, and for women, there's a list of reproduct preventive reproductive health services, including breast exams and can cervical cancer screenings and STD screenings and birth control. Because birth control is absolutely fundamental to women's basic health, right? Unintended pregnancy is a well-known driver of infant mortality. It is a well-known driver of maternal mortality. It is a well-known driver of maternal morbidity permanent damage to a woman's reproductive health system if uh, she has uh, unintended pregnancies. It's, it's, it, it, this, is, this is well known. Apparently, the head of Hobby Lobby either doesn't know or doesn't care about this because he has sued the United States government because he wants to be able for the whole list. As if there's 50 preventive services that have to be covered by insurance companies. And he wants to take that whole list of 50 and take out birth control simply because he says he has a religious objection to women utilizing birth control. Because it's against his religion for the women in this room to utilize birth control. Right? Never mind individual women's First Amendment right to have their own religious dictates decide their health care, never mind individual women's 14th Amendment to right to the equal protection of the laws that would prevent discrimination in the application of health care, never mind individual women's uh, right to privacy and to make the decision for herself whether she wants to take contraception. Right? All of those rights are somehow not as important as this man's religious scruples, supposed religious scruples about birth control. Uh, my organization, along with 85 other women's rights organizations, uh, have submitted uh, an amicus brief to the Supreme Court talking about the importance of birth control for women. Um, but we don't know how the Supreme Court is going to rule. Um, those of you who are so moved can come down to Washington on March 25th. That's the day that the Supreme Court's arguments will be had. We're expecting about 1,000 people to come uh, to rally in front of the Supreme Court building to show our support for uh, women's access to birth control. So um, the, the, I, I said before, the Tea Party control of the United States House of Representatives is really a big driver of this. Um, there are now 100 for-profit organizations and non-profit organizations, we're calling them the Dirty 100. You can go to now.org and find out more information. And by the way, Eden Foods, anybody of you have ever bought Eden Soy? It's great soy milk, it's really good, don't. I'm telling you right now, I will not use them again. They're part of the Dirty 100. They are one of the people, they're one of the companies that has sued the United States government because they want to be able to strip birth control out of the list of preventive services that have to be covered. It's completely outrageous. So we've got a petition up on our website, and we urge all of you to go and sign it, saying that you will learn who the Dirty 100 are, and you absolutely will not do business with them, and you'll tell all your friends why you're not doing business with them, and urge your friends to think carefully about the, about the ethics and the morality of doing business with individuals and companies that try to use religion as a screen for bigotry. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be working on that. Um, uh, so we're going to be there on March 25th. I hope you all will, will join us uh, and, and uh, make your voices heard. Uh, elections, here's, so, so elections have consequences. All the pundits in Washington are now saying that the uh, Senate, the House will probably remain in the control of the Republican Party. And by the way, we are nonpartisan at now, but the Republican Party has become so anti woman that we have a really hard time finding Republicans to support. So when I say that we don't want to, we, that we, we're not going to be able to take back control of the House, we don't want to lose control of the Senate, and it sounds very partisan, well, there's a reason for that. And I look forward to the day when we can support Republican candidates and we can support Republican politicians because they're not going after women uh, and women's rights. Um, so losing, losing control of the Senate 
will mean enactment of the Let the Women Die bill, will mean enactment of the uh, uh, No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion uh, Act, will mean enactment of the so-called Blunt Amendment. That is an amendment proposed in the Senate, we blocked it in the Senate, that would allow any company, and in fact encourage any company, to take birth control off the list of preventive services that have to be covered by health insurance. It's completely outrageous. I have no doubt that President Obama will veto um, the vast majority of such bills. But make no mistake, the President will be faced with bill after bill after bill after bill to try to stop women from accessing basic health. So that's, uh, that's where we stand. That's why I'm, I'm focused on the number 42. We've got to get, I mean, our job, and, and we've got lots of allies who are, who are um, engaged with other aspects of the rising American electorate. Um, but, but that's my job, is to move from 38 to 42, and I'm kind of focused on it. One final note before I open it up to a uh, question and answer. You know, attacks on women's access to health care are not the only way uh, that the Tea Party has gone after women. Uh, the other way that they've done it is through the United States budget. Through the United States budget, the funding uh, for programs. Right? Uh, Paul Ryan, recognize the name? Right, we know the name. How, how many of you have read the coverage of his budget, his 2011 budget, the 12, the 13, 14, and 15? Right? It's, it's an absolutely astonishingly misogynist document, right? Um, so, so in, in large, sort of the, the top line of his budget, uh, convert Social Security to a Wall Street sort of 401k program, P privatizes Social Security completely. And, and not in every budget, but in... in, in no, a number of the budgets C has proposed since 2010. Um, uh, converts Medicare to a private voucher system. One year, his Medicare proposal was just jaw-dropping. The way it would work is that if you're on Medicare, you get so many vouchers equating to so many dollars or so many doctor visits, right, at the beginning of the year. And when you've used up your vouchers, no matter how sick you got during the year, that's it. You're on your own. You've used up all your vouchers. Now you have to dip into your pocket in order to pay your medical costs, right? Um, uh, so, it, it, and so Medicare, Social Security would convert Medicaid to a state block grant program. Um, and it would slash funding for social programs like Head Start and job training and tuition assistance and uh, nutrition assistance. All of the programs slated for deep cuts in the Ryan budget are programs that are very disproportionately utilized by women. And, and something that a lot of people don't think about when they're looking at these programs, the vast majority of these programs employ women disproportionately. Because who works, who works in administering these programs? I'll tell you who. Social workers and case managers and educators and home health care workers and child care workers and, and, uh, and teachers very disproportionately women. So, so and, and what does Ryan do with all the savings he's gonna get from, from, these, from all of these measures? Expand the military budget, hint, that's not where the women are, right? And give big tax breaks to billionaires and corporations, and here's another hint, that's not where the women are either, right? So, so if you look at a, a Senate takeover by the Republican Party, you're also looking right at the Ryan budget. Um, and that is something that women absolutely can't do. And I, I said I was going to stop talking. Give me just one more second. The gender wage gap is at 77%. Women currently are making about $77 compared to the dollar paid to men. For African American women, the number is more like 64 cents to the dollar. And for Latinas in this country, the, the, the number is more like 59 cents to the dollar, right? So when you think about women not being able to access uh, government-supported child care programs or tuition assistance programs, one of the things you want to have in your mind is, is the picture of women, so many women 
who are struggling on 59 cents to the dollar and 64 cents to the dollar and 77 cents to the dollar. And so they're getting less money coming in and women have more money going out the door. Right? Women are uh, more likely than men to be financially responsible, not merely for children, but also for elders. So less money coming in, more money going out, and Paul Ryan wants to cut, cut down the programs that many women rely on to be able to keep their jobs, like childcare and after school programs, and keep themselves in the middle class. The Ryan budget is no doubt in my mind, the Ryan budget would push millions of women across the threshold out of the middle class and into poverty. And that is not what we want. So elections matter and I want all of you to, if you take nothing else away from this afternoon, think about what you can do to get women out to vote in the 2014 elections. All right, with that, I'm going to stop talking a little bit and maybe throw it open for questions. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Oh, okay. you probably all heard me anyway, right? Yeah. Bus. Okay. So if you want to come get on the Planned Parenthood bus and come down to DC with us, um, you can find information on our website about how to sign up for that. Thanks. That was great. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that. Thank you. You were um, talking about increasing the voter turnout, and I just wonder, with all the money that's coming across state lines from the Koch brothers and other, you know, as you mentioned, the right. Citizens United, and just wonder what your comments are on that. Um, the, so the strategy of the Koch brothers and of the Republicans that they uh, that, that that they are funding is <clears throat> is to suppress the vote. That's what a, a lot of their dollars are uh, are, are aimed at. Um, the, the attacks that they've launched against Wendy Davis, for example, in, um, in Texas, against Allison Schwartz in, in Pennsylvania, it, a lot of it is, uh, is gear, and, I, and I, they've clearly done the research. When you um, go negative very, very early in a campaign, in a society where the media generally treats uh, campaigns not as opportunities for policy discussions, but more as a horse race, who's up, who's down, and, and that you actually turn off a lot of the very voters who would vote progressive if they came out to the polls. And, and, uh, and in fact, uh, Paige Gardner, whose organization is called, um, it used to be Women, Women's Voices, Women's Vote, and they, they just changed it this year to the Voter Participation Center. So if you go, on, go Google the Voter Participation Center, you'll find some really um, uh, wonderful uh, statistics on it. Um, she did a lot of focus groups and polling to find out about 10 years ago why is it that unmarried women were, vote, were not voting? They, they, they historically have had very low voter turnout. And in focus groups, time after time after time, you know, women would say, yes, it, these policies are important to me. And yes, I would vote for someone. And yes, I think it's important for me to go and vote. And then you say, well, did you vote in the last election? Well, no, I didn't. Why not? Well, I was busy. And more importantly, and, and let's, let's remember, women, less money coming in, more money going out. You bet they're busy uh, and, and they're multitasking and taking the kids to the doctor and making sure that mom is okay and, and, and taking care of mom's financials and, and, and various things. Another very telling thing that women repeatedly said <clears throat> was that I don't really think politics is all that much about me. You know, and then you would say, well, it's about the policies and they have an impact on your life. And yeah, but the politics is just really not that much about me. So she, Paige is of the opinion that when candidates talk to women voters about the issues that actually face women, when candidates talk openly and honestly about women's need to be able to access health care, when candidates actually use the phrase child care, when candidates say anything that ends in care, right? Then actually you get a lot more, uh, you, you get a, a significant uptick in women's willingness to engage in the political process, right? 
Um, and and I, I can give you a classic example. Terry McAuliffe ran for governor in, in Virginia last year. He was very open. He was very explicit. He was going to keep those abortion clinics open. His opponent, uh, Ken Cuccinelli, was determined to shut them down. Uh, Terry McAuliffe, uncharacteristically for a nationally known Democrat, went after the women's vote talking about the issues that women talk about uh, amongst themselves. And he, he basically... Um, took a, a page out of the Obama campaign in 2012, which also, by the way, had higher engagement of women voters. So, so how we counter the Koch money is with getting the candidates to talk directly to women, and then women will come and vote, I believe. It's, it's all we got, because we don't have their kind of money. Yes? Uh, the, the, the NOW uh, has traditionally uh, proud itself on being a non-political uh, organization, non-Republican, non-Democrat, we're just right, neutral, we're in the middle of the right. road. Yes. And I kind of hear that you want to lean towards the Republican Party. Uh, I kind of see a society where we're kind of in a fight right now. <clears throat> I mean, you see some of the fights down the hill right now where uh, there's a need to drive more bipartisan decisions, uh, mainly because a lot of these issues, uh, a lot of constituents feel are more or less more, you know, it's, it's about the humanity of the issue and that party lines have no real necessity in, in being discussed to make a decision. So I'm kind of like thinking out loud with you and, 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 and trying to see, you know, as far as the future of NLW and, and, and the new wave, the new tidal wave of bipartisan decision making, you know, where, where, where are you guys at with that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question because I think it's really worth thinking a little bit about the difference between bipartisan uh, <clears throat> uh, solutions and nonpartisan solutions, right? Um, Nonpartisan solutions, Patricia Ireland, former president of, of NOW, used to say, at NOW we don't have any permanent friends and we don't have any permanent enemies, just permanent issues, right? Um, and, and, and that's really the nonpartisan approach. We, it is very hard for a Democrat to get the endorsement of the NOW PAC. It is currently impossible. For, for, for three or four election cycles, it has been impossible for a Republican to get an endorsement of the federal NOW PAC. Um, <clears throat> but it's hard for, the, for the, even Democrats to get that endorsement from us because we have it's six interlocking issues. It's very, we, we, you have to be really good on all of our issues, right? Um, and, and that's what I mean when I say nonpartisan. Uh, we have been extremely critical of any politician, from the president to senators, Democratic and Republican, to representatives, Democratic and Republican, who we felt uh, supported a policy that was not good for women. We have been extremely um, uh, proud and praiseful of specific actions by politicians that we thought were really good for women. And let me, so, so that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from when I talk about nonpartisanship. We look at, at, at um, policies and specific votes by politicians on specific policies, by legislators. Bipartisanship is a really tricky issue. Okay, so, so now is part of a, a coalition against uh, uh, violence against women. And in the 112th Congress, the Violence Against Women Act needed to be uh, reauthorized. There's a coalition working on reauthorization. Uh, the Republican staffers in the House of Representatives put extraordinary pressure on the coalition members they said, you've got to be bipartisan, you know, bipartisan is the, is the key word. Now, you know, over in the Senate, uh, Patty Murray was working on a, a bill uh, to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act, and, it, and Patty Murray is not an advocate. She's a senator. There's a huge difference, right? She's, her job is to compromise. Her job is to go and get votes from people of both parties, right? It's not my job. That's her job, and it's not the job of advocates. But I found myself sitting in a meeting over on the House side 
with Republican staffers who basically were lecturing the little ladies about how important it was to be bipartisan and therefore to accept some aspects of reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act that we, I knew for a fact that we would not, uh, now was not going to accept. One of which, for example, was to, was to uh, exclude immigrant women from the reauthorization of the law and exclude the special issues that immigrant women face when they, are, when they experience sexual assault or domestic violence or dating violence or stalking. Another thing that they wanted to do was to exclude women on reservations who, by the way, experience huge rates of sexual assault because the tribal authorities aren't allowed to pursue rapists uh, if the rapist is not a member of the tribe. Right, so the Republicans wanted to exclude all these women, and we said we want an inclusive bill. Now, over in the Senate, they kept saying bipartisan, inclusive, ba VAWA reauthorization. And when I heard this, oh yeah, if you want to be bipartisan, you'll have to accept these compromises, I, I was appalled, absolutely appalled. And, and I came back and told my staff, it is never, ever, and I told this to the, our coalition partners too, it is never the job of an advocate to have to accept compromise. The advocate wants to, that's fine, but that is not our obligation. It is not our role in the political process. Our role is to push for the principles that we stand for and to stand for those principles and to criticize our friend. I have frequently said, and you know, I say this about uh, the White House as much as I say it about anybody, and I worked personally very, very hard to elect Barack Obama president in 2008. It was one of the few times now has ever endorsed a candidate, and also to re-elect him in 2012. But I have frequently said, you know, friends tell friends when they have messed up. And sometimes when I'm in private, I don't say messed. Um, <laughs> but that you, you, we, we whine to our, we may attack our enemies and whine to our friends, so we express our displeasure a little bit differently. But we clearly express displeasure. Well, I say thank you for that position. I think that's an excellent <laughs> position for an advocate. I'm fascinated by this unmarried women. I feel like I'm pretty politically savvy, and I don't know that I've ever really heard unmarried women pulled out. Women, 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 right? Yes. Women's vote, women's vote, women's vote. How are women polling? How are we But unmarried women. So I have a two-part question. One is age. Are you looking at unmarried women at all ages? Um, and then the second one is, what happens when they get married? Do they become conservative? Like, I'm trying to think, <laughs> because if unmarried women, and again, I, I'm assuming it's all ages. My mother's 83, and she's an incredibly progressive woman and has become more and more progressive as she's gotten older. And she's unmarried. My dad has passed away. But so what happens when they, why aren't married women polling the same? Uh, that is a fabulous question and I don't know the answer to it but I think Paige Gardner probably does and she's delved into um, uh, the, the numbers really really deeply and she'll look at all the cross tabulations the you know unmarried women broken out by race and by age and by uh, education level and by zip code and you know you're really trying to figure out what the patterns are but when she started looking at this 15 years ago what really she was looking at women and what really jumped out at her was whoa there's a real marriage gap and that marriage gap seems to be getting uh, more and more um, important. So for example, in the 2012 elections, uh, and I hope I have these statistics, I, I can't remember the numbers, but married women voted uh, on average for Mitt Romney. But unmarried women, all races, unmarried women, all races voted on average for Barack Obama. White women, married and unmarried in, in the aggregate, voted for Mitt Romney, I'm sorry to say. As I usually say, oi, my people. Um, yeah, so, uh, but it, it, it definitely deserves a, a really deep look, and, and I don't know the answer. But I, but I know what my job is. I gotta go unmarried women, 38 to 42, that's what I'm focused on. That's good. We have, I think we have. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. One thing that occurs to me with voter turnout is you often hear the term single issue voter. 
And I wonder, I have wondered if we're not missing an opportunity to uh, get women to see these issues in more economic terms. Because to me, I'm a mother, uh, there's no greater um, impact on my financial well-being and life than the fact that I chose to have a child. And you very seldom hear the link made, but I'll hear women say, well, yes, I'm concerned about women's issues, but I'm more concerned about the economy. And I keep saying, it is the economy, stupid. Yes. And no yes. one's making that link. And I mean, I heard Gloria Steinem make that link one time. Right. But that's been it. And I just wonder if we're not, maybe not doing enough to make that link. You know, I, I uh, um, how do I put this? I actually have, I've been president of now for four and a half years, and I have spent the past four and a half years trying to make the economic case uh, for women's, that, that, that it is all about the economy. And in fact, it was when, 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 the, when the U.S. Congress was just tying itself up in knots trying to shut down Planned Parenthood. Right and trying to defund Planned Parenthood, and and we were all in this big fight, and I and I was I had I really had fun. I normally don't uh, give comments to right wing newspapers because or and or even to right wing television or radio. I often tell my staff I can make myself look stupid all by myself. I don't need Bill O'Reilly <laughs> helping me. Um, so, but somebody scheduled me to just give a comment to the Washington Times. It's it's a it's a it's a very conservative paper in D.C. And, and what they wanted to comment on was this group that I promise you I had never heard of. It was called Americans United for Life. By the way, it's a Koch Brothers slash um, uh, Knights of Columbus funded group. And they have millions, they get millions from the boys to do their anti-woman uh, work. Anyway, Americans United for, for Life uh, had called for a congressional investigation of Planned Parenthood based on some bogus uh, uh, video investigation, whatever, whatever. So the, so the reporter wanted a, a comment, and I was a little irritated with my staff for, you know, saying, yes, she'll give you a comment. So, so I get on the phone and I said, you want a comment from me? They go, yes. He's, I said, Planned Parenthood saves lives. And there was a silence. The reporter said, uh-huh. And I said, let me just tell you how this works. Planned Parenthood saves the lives of young women and teenage girls every single day, and I don't think that's something you can say about this um, Americans United for Life, whoever they are. So the Washington Times gave the whole quote. <laughs> and I got flowers from Planned Parenthood the next day. It was really fun. <laughs> Um, but but it, it, during that whole thing, and it was the and the blunt amendment was going on. It was anti-birth control and, and anti-Planned Parenthood. I got a phone message on my office phone from a man who called to say thank you so much for your advocacy around birth control. He said I get that it's part of my wife's basic health care, and I care about her health. He said, but I have to tell you, it's as much about our family's finances as it is about her health. He says, we've already got two kids. This was 2011. We were not out of the recession in terms of jobs. We're still not. Uh, and he says, we've got two kids, and we can't afford another one right now. And I don't know what we would do if my wife didn't have access to contraception and if she got pregnant. So I tell that story to say that the voters absolutely get the connection. Women get it. Men get it. Who's not getting it is the politicians. Where you're not hearing it is you're not hearing it from the politicians. Now, <clears throat> some Democrats have begun saying it. And my view is that we need to reward those Democrats for saying it with lots and lots of votes. Big votes. But we've got to have that conversation. And I have to tell you, most of the time when leaders of women's rights organizations um, are asked to come and comment in print journalism, on, on television and the radio, uh, about some issue, it's almost never about money. It's almost always about uh, reproductive health care. You know, they see a woman and they just see that one big part. <laughs> I had a question. I'm, I live in Florida, and this uh, at the last election, I volunteered as a voter protection attorney the last two elections, and I um, the two election cycles ago went and voted on a Sunday. 
and I assumed that I could do that this year, too, uh, the last election too, and it wasn't open, and then I waited four hours in line, and I'm a professor, so I can do that, but most people, if you're trying to get that population out, how do you get that population not just to get out to vote, but to stay and wait and actually get their, you know, people don't have that kind of time or can't give that kind of time. And if there's only voting on one day or very limited, what are we going to do about that? Uh, that's an excellent question. And by the way, um, all of these voter suppression uh, measures, shutting down the Sunday voting, restricting the time period over which you can go to your local election office and vote, right? Um, uh, the the, the um, uh, Shortening the hours during which the the, the polls are open, all of that, and voter ID, and in particular, photo, uh, photographic voter ID, all of those voter suppression measures disproportionately impact women, all of them. Why? Because they're aimed at communities of color, they're aimed at lower income communities, they're aimed at student communities, and they are aimed at, um, at, at um, uh, elderly, at the elderly. Um, the, the reason it disproportionately impacts women, obviously, is that women are more likely to have to work two jobs. By the way, here's a factoid that's just startling. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics recognizes over 500, I think it's like 523 job categories. Of those 500 and some job categories, only 25, there are only 25 where women constitute 50% or more of the uh, workers. Right. That the, the head of uh, wider opportunities for women mentioned that to me uh, a while ago. She said it's just, it's it's a it's a really startling um, uh, example or sort of manifestation of how women are corralled into certain types of jobs, service, care, retail, that sort of thing. But if you're working at Walmart, right, at 28 hours a week when you can get it, you kind of need to have that second job, and you really don't have a lot of flexibility especially when you have other caring um, ob uh, obligations in your life. So what we do about it, one of the things that was done about it, I was in Cleveland in the 2012 elections when John Houston, then the Secretary of State, tried to shut down the, the Sunday voting, what we call the souls to the polls, right? Um, and, uh, and, and so it, it was, people were standing in line for six hours, freezing cold, uh, to vote on the Saturday. And I was walking up and down, a friend of mine and I were walking up and down. We had gone and gotten those big boxes of uh, coffee. And so we were, we were offering hot coffee to people st standing in the line. Um, but, but there was huge anger. There was huge resentment against John Husted. Uh, and by the way, if, if, you do, if you know anybody who lives in Ohio, tell them to vote for Nina Turner for Secretary of State. She's wonderful, she's amazing, and she needs to take out John Husted. We need to get rid of him, and she's just fabulous. Um, but there, there actually was an upsurge in some communities in voting rates because the community leaders were so angry about the attempts to shut it down. So again, we have to fight the money and the corrupt laws with just, you know, people power. We just have to get our people out. While I wait for the next question, I just wanted to put in a plug for one of our colleagues here, Professor Gilda Daniels, who entire scholarly project is dealing with issues of voter ID, voter suppression, and so on and so forth. Right. The yeah, the voter ID thing is, is just ridiculous. Uh, uh, the majority of women, I think it's the majority of women, uh, change their names when they get married, right? And if they have to go and they, they don't drive, and they, so now they don't have a driver's license, so they have to get a, fo a voter photo ID, and it's harder for women than it is for men because you have a history of name changes, and, and it's just completely ridiculous, yeah. Thank you for being here. So whenever I come to these kinds of things, it's mostly depressing. <laughs> um, and what I'm wondering, I'm always wondering, where is our strategy? Where are we on the offense? The, the Sunday voting was strategic. It was a part of a 15, 20 year playbook. Exactly. Where are we doing that kind of 20-year planning? Here we are today, 20 years from now, we plan to be in a different place, and this is our policy playbook right. and our organizing strategy to get there. That's what they did. 
and, and now it's coming home to roost for a lot of us in negative ways, also being from Florida. <laughs> and, and so yeah, I'm yes. just wondering, where are those resources for right. us for okay. that 20-year, 50-year view? All right, two things. First, I'm going to tell you what NOW is doing. And then I'll tell you a really huge, we're just starting. And so we've, uh, we've got a 15, 20-year uh, uh, path. I would say. I, I, you know, it's not, I mean, but calling it a plan is a little, is probably a bit of an exaggeration, but, but, but we have been, um, we believe in now that the entire women's movement needs to sort of have a bit of a reset. I said we are being pushed back, and we are, stay in, at the state level. Um, the reset is, uh, we're trying to we're trying to gin up a lot more um, uh, community organizing in, in in state capitals, a lot more organizing in state capitals. Yes, that's tactical, but the more strategic reset that we're doing is a um, is movement building, right? And we don't, nobody has a lot of resources in the women's movement. All the women's organizations are very thinly resourced, and we do a conference every year. So we are we are repurposing the annual now conference to be at least for the first half of it. So it's a three-day conference, and the first, the, the first day and a half is movement building. What will it take to create a, a, uh, a diverse and inclusive national organization for women within a diverse and inclusive women's movement that practices intersectionality, that understands that different women in different communities experience the exact same policy problems in very different ways. Well, you need a sort of a, a mosaic of responses to the mosaic of impacts that the very same policy might have, right, on, on various people. That is, that is a long-term project. And, uh, but the vision of it is that, that, um, that now will actually look like the rising American electorate. You know, by 2040 or 2050, we will be a majority minority country. And, and, and our goal is to have the women's movement not just recognize it in a sort of superficial way, but in a very, very deep way. So, so, so I think, so that's a strategy that I think is, is extremely important. Um, and I've also been advocating within the reproductive health and justice movement to create a strategy for full funding. I mean, we now has, has, has supported single payer health care for decades. But I think that in the reproductive health and justice movement, we need to have a specific strategy around full funding for every aspect of reproductive health care for all women, right? Yeah, the, the, the All Above All campaign is, uh, is, is very exciting. The National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health and, the, and NAPOF and a number of other women's organizations have, uh, have really begun creating this fabulous All Above All campaign, which is to uh, repeal the Hyde Amendment. Um, but, but we need a, a really, a, a, it needs to be a 15 to 20 year campaign uh, to, to get the concept that it's all of us and any of us could have a reproductive health care need. And we live in a civilized society and part of that means that women get the reproductive health care they need no matter where they are, where they live, who they love, what they look like, everybody uh, gets it. So, so that, but, but, and that's a, a tiny little seed. The reason that you're right, these 20-year campaigns absolutely work, take a look at the LGBT community, right? It was, they're, they're for, by my calculations, they're about two years ahead of their 15-year plan, right? And it, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating. When you look at the, at, at, the, at the decision in the LGBT community to say, all right, we're going to take our stand on marriage. It could have been on adoption, right? Because back 10, 15 years ago, adoption was a very hot issue. Uh, there are a lot of states like Florida and uh, Louisiana, where I was teaching law, trying to, to um, uh, like make it unconstitutional for uh, same-sex couples to even adopt a child. It could have been on housing. It could have been on um, employment discrimination. There's a lot of ways to sort of um, uh, enter the, the issue of civil and human rights for, for the LGBT community. <laughs> And it took a while, I think, for th there to be a coalescing around marriage. Once, once there was a coalescing, a lessing around that the, the group said, "All right, we're gonna we're gonna go for marriage, and let's see what happens." Now look what has happened by advocating for marriage, by ta by thinking deeply about what it means to advocate for marriage, by talking about loving and committed couples, by talking about real commitment, 
um, including, you know, the, the jokes, right? So all the heterosexuals who have been divorced, hey, go find a gay friend of yours, you can blame them, um, because they, they're making marriage somehow bad for us. Um, but, but by thinking about this, the entire project of civil and human rights for gays, lesbians, bisexuals, transgender people um, has, has moved forward hugely. Today, not only do we have a majority of people in this country who support marriage rights, but you also have a majority of people in this country who believe that their LGBT neighbors are just as fully human, just as fully deserving of basic respect and civil rights and human rights. And, and like I said, they're about two years ahead of their 15-year plan. Inspiring way to end the presentation <laughs> today on, a, on an upbeat note. And um, I really want to thank Terry O'Neill for joining us and getting us fired up to create some change. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight um, to share in this conversation. For the workshop and conference presenters, we will meet in the lobby after this for the next phase of our conference. And for the rest of our attendees, we hope you have a great evening. And we look forward to seeing you back here in the Moot Courtroom tomorrow for the rest of the conference. So good night. <laughs>